continue with mercy me. And today what I want to touch on very quickly as I began to study more on mercy, um, I discovered there are four types of mercy that I will share with you today. Four types of mercy. And we're going to go through those very quickly and hear what the Lord will say. Amen. Remember last week we talked about the Lord declaring his name to Moses. And he says, I am the Lord, I am the Lord merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving to a thousand. And the more I reflect on God's mercy, it is evident that mercy is not something that we can bargain with. We cannot buy it. We cannot uh, bribe God to give it. It is simply who he is. It is in his nature. And so one of the first types of mercies that I discovered as I began to read is what I would like to call prevailing mercy. Somebody say prevailing mercy. Now, when we talk about mercy, I wanted to find the definition of mercy according to the English dictionary, and he says, it is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. The first type I said is prevailing mercy, and if I would describe what that is, I would say it is mercy available for all. It is general mercy. It is there for everyone. The scripture that comes to mind that we will look at, we're going to look at the NKJV today, um, audiovisual. Psalm 145 verse 9, put up the NKJV version. We're going to use NKJV today. And it says this, the Lord is good to who? The Lord is good to? And his tender mercies are all over his works. Now, the Bible does not say that the Lord is good to some. The Bible does not say the Lord is good to believers. The Bible does not say the Lord is good to people that we like. The Bible says the Lord is good to who? All. All. It makes sense because it says he makes it rain on the just and the unjust. Now, I know we, we like the idea of mercy as long as mercy is shown to the people that we like. Uh-oh. Prevailing mercy is available for all. Lamentations 3, to 23 says this. It says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Why? Because his compassion faileth not. They are, they are new every morning. That means every day you have a new prevailing mercy available for you to exhaust for that day. You know, God says, I know my children, they have coconut head. So I will put mercy available for them every day. Every morning, new mercies. You can't run out of God's mercy. It's inexhaustible. It's tied to his nature. He says there is mercy available for who? For all. Now, we like the idea of mercy being shown to people that we like. And if we're being honest, we struggle with the idea of mercy being shown to people that we don't like. Right? Can we be honest? You know, a lot of times we find ourselves praying against our enemies. God, punish my enemies. God, let them fall down and die. God, enemies, 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 fall down, die, die, fall down, die. Ami, ami. Yes? But here's the problem. As you are praying against your enemies, has it occurred to you that you might be somebody's enemy too? <laughs> so, we should be thankful for the prayers God does not answer. Because if God should take out everybody's enemy, what is an enemy? An enemy that's something I don't like, you just upset me. In that moment, you are my enemy. You hurt me in that moment, you are my enemy. You betrayed me in that moment, you are my enemy. You did something that cost me something, guess what? You are my enemy. So while you are praying, God destroy my enemy. 
you're on someone else's prayer list. God destroy my enemy. If God should destroy all our enemies, there'll be no one left. So it begins to make sense when Jesus is speaking in, in, in the Gospels and he says, you have been told, hate your enemies. Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You have heard it when it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father, where? In heaven. Why? Because he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just. Today, you might be on the good side. Tomorrow, you might be on the evil side, depending on who you ask. In your mind, you are good. In somebody's eyes, you are evil. If somebody asks you for something and you say you don't have and they believe that you have and you're lying to them, in their mind, you are evil. So they are this selfish, wicked, wicked person. Father, punish them. God says, listen, the wisdom is if you pray for everyone, even those that you don't like, if everybody prayed for everybody that they did not like, then we are all covered. Let me give you a picture of what we look like because we, we've said God's mercy is available for all every morning, every day. We enjoy it without fail. But then we want to hoard or decide who is, who is, who is, what's the word I'm looking for? Who is qualified to experience God's mercy. God's mercy is for me and me alone. It's for the people that are like, it's for us believers. We who receive mercy that we do not pay for, we get angry. Have you seen when somebody has done, remember I told you a story about when that guy came to the house and all the people were angry because I was showing him mercy? That's how we are. We get angry when we feel like what they should get, they deserve the punishment for what they have done. Let me show you a picture of us. Let's go to Jonah really quickly. I want to show you something. Jonah 4. <laughs> Jonah 4, I want to show you something. Jonah 4, I'm going to read 1 to 11 very quickly. So, we know the story of Jonah. God says, go to Nineveh. He's like, no. <laughs> go to Nineveh. He jumps on a ship going somewhere else. God is like, shh. Whoa. Storm. What's going on? It's okay. It's me. Throw me aboard. They throw him over. The whale comes, swallows him. He's in the belly of a fish for a couple of days. Begins to cry unto the Lord. The Lord sends the whale or the fish to the shores of Nineveh. And then they throw up Jonah. And then Jonah grudgingly goes to tell the, the inhabitants of Nineveh to repent. That God was going to destroy them if they didn't repent. And he did it and he left. Hoping that they would not repent. Because he wanted God to give them judgment. These are wicked people. They should die by fire. Jonah 4. Let's put it up there, verse 1. Now. Then pick it up from there. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, ah, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you, that's the problem with you. <laughs> so somebody can sin their whole life. And right before they die, have mercy, Lord. And they went to heaven. How? We have been walking. This is the problem with us. We have been walking from morning. They said they will pay us $10 from morning to night for 12 hours. Somebody comes in the 11th hour. <laughs> and you will pay him the same. Lie, lie. See? You know what we will do? We will fight. It does not concern us, but we will fight because we feel there's a sense of injustice. How can somebody who has worked less get the same thing? Somebody say mercy. 
Ha! Because the parable, the man said, hold on, what was our agreement? Did I not say I will pay you 10? If I have paid you what I have paid you, am I not just? Is it not within my right to show mercy to whom I decide I will show mercy to? Is it not within my right to show compassion? It is not the one who will it or run it, but it is the one who decides to show. So here, Jonah is having an issue with this merciful God. He said, is this not what I said? For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. Look at his name. Slow to what? An abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. That is a stark opposite picture of the God that sometimes has been presented to us. A lot of times they will present God as a God who is waiting for you to sin so he can send you to hell. And then they use fear to try to get you saved instead of the loving kindness of God. The problem with fear is fear will only work as for a while. But fear is not permanent. It is perfect love that casts out all You can't scare people into salvation. The gospel is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The only religion where the God, the central God in the religion is dying for humanity. Every other religion, we must do things to appease God. In our religion, God came to die for us. That is the message of the gospel. You are relentless. You're relenting in doing harm. You relent to do harm. Look at what he says. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it's better for me to die. He was so angry that God was showing Nineveh mercy. He said, I'd rather die than to see these people receive mercy. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, still angry, and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the what? In the shade till he might see what would become. He was still holding out hope that God would just vex and destroy them by fire. So he went to go and find a nice view. Beware, there are certain people in your life that are only there to see you fall. They will come under the guise of friendship, but they, they just want to find a good place. So when he falls, they can take a picture. He went to find a nice view, still hoping, let us see what will become of the what? Of the city. Now what happens? There he made himself a shelter under it, right? And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come over Jonah. That it may be what? Shade for his head to deliver him from his... Amen. So Jonah was very... You know, sometimes we don't realize what we look like till we take a step back and watch ourselves. Jonah was very what? Grateful for the plant. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm... And it so damaged the plant <laughs> that it what? Withered. And it happened that when the sun arose, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head <laughs> so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Oh, I just love the Lord. You know when God is asking you questions, I already know the answers to. <laughs> but the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant, for which you have not what? <laughs> nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, 
that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. It is not his will that anyone should perish. Isn't it interesting that Jonah had the audacity to be angry and then God takes away a plant that he had nothing to do with, the very thing that gave him shade. Sometimes God will remind you that the shade and the mercy you're enjoying is not having anything to do with what you have done. And sometimes he will remove it so you remember that I am not here by my doing, not by power, not by might. You must remember sometimes. Sometimes he will let you enter factory reset so that you remember that you have not gotten here because of anything that you've done, but because God has decided to show you Mercy. How can you be angry that somebody else is experiencing mercy, but the very lungs in your breath, you had nothing to do with it? Who woke you up this morning? Who keeps your heart beating with that anger and vim? You want to fight somebody else? Oh, really? Did you labor for the air in your lungs? Do you see where oxygen comes from? Do you know the ecosystem I have put to take carbon dioxide from you and use plants to, 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 um, 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 to revamp it and give you back oxygen? Do you know what I've done? Do you know the things, the different ecosystems, gravity, all the things I've put in place to allow you to live, to move? Do you know all the complex systems within your body that are working overnight? Have you labored for anything that you have? And then you open up your mouth and say, somebody else cannot receive mercy. Somebody say, mercy, Lord. The first one, because of my time, is what? Prevailing mercy. It's prevailing mercy. Ah, I'm going to show you something really quick. I found something else. Look at Jonah 2 to 8. I want to show you something. Because the question I asked is, Lord, if there is prevailing mercy, why doesn't everyone receive it? If there is mercy for all, why doesn't everyone receive it? The answer, Jonah 2 to 8. Look at what it says. Those who regard worthless idols turn, what is it? They forsake their own what? Those who regard worthless idols forsake a way to forfeit prevailing mercy is to follow idols. Put it in the Amplified. Look at what it says. Those who regard and follow worthless idols turn away from their living source of mercy. When I saw this, I began to realize that even in his commandments, when he gave the, the, um, the children of Israel ten commandments, he was God showing mercy. When he said in Exodus 23 to 4, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any idols or any likeness or form or manifestation for what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath the water under the earth. When he told them do not have any other idols, he knew that once you begin to replace me with an idol, the mercy that I have already put in store for you, you forfeit. Oh, but pastor, I thank God I don't worship uh, uh, any shrine or any, an idol is anything that takes the place of God in your life. An idol can be your job. Uh-oh. An idol can be your goal, your pursuit, your success. An idol can be money. An idol can be fame. An idol can be reputation. An idol can be marriage. Anything that takes the place of God in your life is an idol. And once you begin to follow idols, what are you doing? Forfeiting. Say, I will not forfeit my mercy this month. Say, I will not forfeit my mercy this month. Very quickly. 
Let's go to the second one. Looking at my time. Are you still with me? The second type of mercy that I discovered is encompassing mercy. Somebody say encompassing mercy. You see, the purpose of this mercy is for protection. This kind of mercy is for protection. Put up Psalm 32, 10, NKJV. Back to NKJV. Psalm 32, verse 10. Look at what it says. It says, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, what will happen? Mercy shall surround him. So those who trust in the Lord, it says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your understanding. Those who trust in the Lord, what this scripture is saying is you have mercy surrounding you. There have been many times in your life where you have found yourself in situations where you, shall, you should have been taken out, but what you did not know was mercy was surrounding you. Oh, I can tell you many stories from my personal life about when I should have, I should not be here speaking to you now. There have been many times the devil has tried to take me out. Many times. Was it when I went to the beach as a kid and the waves carried me away at Bar Beach and my mother was on the shore just screaming, my son, my son. I was going. Somebody jumped in into the beach and brought me back. Somebody say mercy. All the time, I split my head on the side of the door. Oh, bless my mother. Split my head on the side of the door and blood was just gushing out. I remember my mother's white wrapper was soaked red. My mother passed out because <laughs> somehow I'm still here. Somebody say mercy. All the time, I had a pencil in my hand as a boy playing in my grandparents' house. 2B pencil, sharp, pointing this way. And I kicked the ball, and my leg went over the ball, and my head entered my eye. And I remember going to the mirror, standing, and I saw a pencil sticking out of my eye, and blood, that's when I started to scream, Yeah! <laughs> and as I screamed, my mother came out, Bless her, passed out. <laughs> because how? But somehow, I have 20 20 vision and I'm not blind. Somebody say mercy. All the time, when I was in the car with my friend, it was winter in the States, and we were in the car and we both fell asleep and we did not know. He fell asleep, I fell asleep. We woke up on the edge of the highway, about to fall. That's when our eyes opened, and then we turned back. <laughs> Somebody say mercy. Oh, I'm not done yet. All the time, when we were in the car, and we're having a, I see sometimes, see this mercy, it's not even based on anything that you've done. It's not because I was praying the most. You see, sometimes it's good to pray for your children. Because when you saw the seeds and you released the words into the atmosphere, God said, ah, hey, angel, angel, go there, go there. And you have no idea because sometimes it's not even you that is doing the trusting. It's your parents trusting for you. It's your brother trusting for you. That's why it is good to stand in the gap, to intercede for your brother, intercede for your sister, intercede for that family member. Because you do not know when mercy is speaking for them. All the time, I was in a car with my friend. It was winter. I entered. We were going to church for a meeting. And he asked me five minutes before, he says, do you know how to drive in the snow? I'm like, of course. I've been driving for a while. He says, whatever you do, if the car ever starts to spin, don't slam on the brakes. Because if you slam on the brakes, the car will flip. I'm like, yeah, I know that. As soon as we said that, we listened to Kirk Franklin. All of a sudden, get on the highway, a patch of black ice. And black ice is when it rains. And because it's cold, it freezes, so the ice is so thin that you don't see it. It looks clear, it looks like road, but it's ice. So we hit the ice. I was driving a two-seater sports car, and all of a sudden, 
the, it starts to spin crazy on the highway. And then he slams into the corner. Bear in mind, I do not have my seatbelt on. And we hit so hard that the airbags came out. Now, anyone will tell you for the airbags to come out to stop that way, what should happen? I should fly through the window. But while we were spinning, I felt a hand on my chest pushing me back into my chair and refusing for me to move. I felt an impression on my chest. So I was still in my car. While the smash happened, boom, airbags came out. I did not move. We come out. I go look at the front of my car, completely totaled. The whole front gone, right off. While we are there looking at my car, I look up the highway and I see lights coming. And I heard myself say, run! I don't know why I said that, but I found myself running. Jumping over the, the edge of the bridge, down the highway, I was running. And here's what happened. As soon as I shouted run, the car that we could not see was a tanker carrying petrol. And then actually, before, I'm sorry, before that, the first car we did not see, it came up, it started to swerve, and it hit exactly where we were. So if we had not jumped before we saw it, there's no way that car would not have smashed us. So we saw one barrel, boom, we're already there. Ha, as we're walking up, the tanker with petrol was coming. Oh, my, we were running because I will not come and die <laughs> after God has delivered me. The tanker hits the patch of ice in front of us. It begins to skid. It tilts on the side, carrying the whole thing. Now, I knew that if that thing tipped over, there was no way. Skid, 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 tilted, fell back on all eight or 16 tires and began to drive. Somebody say, mercy. Encompassing mercy. Or was it the time when we had pastor's retreats and they robbed on Lecky Admiralty? And remember that story. And they took a lot of people died. I watched almost 10 people die in front of me. They did not tell me. I saw it right in front of my car. This was my car. This was another bus. There was a hillox. I watched the robbers execute four policemen in the hillox right in front of me. Man will be bullets at close range. No, just, it was quite surreal. Everybody was trying to stand still because any sudden noise, nobody wanted to draw any attention to themselves. Somebody tried to move from his car, they shot him in front of his car. So everybody was still, but the devil is wicked. And my driver at the time could not see. His head was down, the door was open, was pretending to be dead. <laughs> That's how it was, open the door, that's how it is. So his head was down. And he could not see what was happening. But I was in the back seat. And the mercy of God, that day, for some reason, God said I should take Corolla, my sister's Corolla. And I had my Jeep that was tinted and black. I didn't even put police lights in front of it. But here's the thing. Every car that looked like it had police presence inside, they shot at. Anything that looked like police. One, they shot into his car. They were shooting into the, into the police station, into the filling station. They took over Admiralty for almost 45 minutes. From Link Bridge, from Ikoi, crossed over down to half of Admiralty. Shot down. Eyes bloodshot red. You know these people were high. They were not hesitant to kill. Use the machete on somebody's leg. They were ready. Anybody could go. My driver. <laughs> After they had executed those four policemen in front of me, Right at that moment, my driver's leg decides to press accelerator. I kid you not. And all you heard was, vroom! The devil is a bastard. Left to the devil, we will not be here. Because he knew what was waiting in the future. He said, vroom! All of a sudden, the man who had just finished shooting 
the policeman in front of me. I could see him. I was in the back seat watching, looking through the window. He looked at the car, took the gun, turned it on my car, and our eyes met. Hand on the trigger, looking at me. I was looking at him. He was looking at me. As if to say, who, who dared the bastard? As if to say, who's the person that wants to die? And his hand was on the trigger, but my seat did not let him pull it. And after what felt like an eternity, he looked, turned the gun, and walked past my car. Somebody say, encompassing mercy. It is mercy of protection. It makes sense. When you see Job 1, verses 9 to 10, God and, 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 and the devil were having a conversation. Job 1, 9 to 10, he says, So Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a what? A hedge around him, around his household, and all around that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased. I believe that hedge, that hedge, that hedge was a protection of mercy. It is this same protection, this encompassing mercy you will find in John when they found the woman who had been caught in adultery and they bring her before Jesus, surrounded by her enemies and she's about to be stoned. But remember, he is a high priest. He is mercy personified. He is mercy in human form. And he asked them a question. Although surrounded by her enemies, mercy asked a question. He who is without sin cast the first stone. And just like that, where she was surrounded by her enemies, she became encompassed by mercy. Somebody say mercy. Somebody shout mercy. I'm looking at my time. The third one, somebody say show mercy. This is the third kind of mercy. The purpose of this mercy is to provide support, is to become a pillar when we need it the most. It is dependable. It is our spiritual collateral. <laughs> we can take it to the back. Isaiah 55 verse 3, put it on the screen. It says this. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall what? Live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The what? Sure. The sure mercies of David. What does sure mercies look like? Let's continue down Isaiah 55. Go to verse 4. This is what sure mercy does. It says, Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation. You shall call a nation that you do not know, and the nations who do not know you shall what? Because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has what? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he, who, he will have what? mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly what? Why? For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts higher than yours. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there 
but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It's sure. If it comes out from his mouth, he says what? It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the things for which I have sent it. If you incline your ears to me, the Lord says, if you draw near to me, remember the conversation was, um, it started last week with Moses and God having a conversation about show me your glory, show me your presence. If your presence does not go with me, I do not want to go. It was about seeking the presence. If you want to see, show mercies. Incline your ears and come, says the Lord. If you hear me, he says, your soul shall live. I wish I had more time to jump into that, but because of time, I'll move. The last one. Somebody say, great mercy. Somebody say, great mercy. Somebody shout, great mercy. You see, this kind of mercy is the one that establishes you. This is the one that takes you from nothing to something. This is the one that takes you from the back to the front. Second Chronicles 1 to 8. I want to show you something. Second Chronicles 1 to 8, it says this. And Solomon said to God, you have shown me what? You have shown great mercy. To David, my father, and you have made me king in his place. What was significant about this? You must understand <laughs> that based on birth, Solomon had no business being king. Solomon was not number one or number two. The first was Ammon. The second was Absalom. Sorry, the second was Daniel. The third was Absalom. The fourth was Adonijah. Adonijah, remember, had a claim to be king because if it's by birth or by right, Adonijah had a reason to be king. Solomon was not fifth. He was not sixth. He was not the seventh son. He was not the eighth son. He was not the ninth son. He was the tenth son of the fourth wife, the last born of the fourth wife. How? How, sir, how number 10 of the fourth wife is now the king? Somebody say great mercy. You see, great mercy will bring you from the back. Great mercy will say he does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Great mercy will put you in rooms that you have no business being. Great mercy will open doors that you have not worked for. Solomon says, you have shown me what? Great mercy. Ah. Now, when you look at 2 Chronicles 16, 19, it says this, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself what? Strong to those on behalf whose hearts are loyal to him. Listen, man may not know where you are, but God knows where you are. <laughs> Somebody shout great mercy. Genesis 32, 9 to 10. Genesis 32, 9 to 10. Then Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country, and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and the truth which you have shown your servant. Why? For I crossed over the Jordan with my staff, and now I have become what? Two companies. He left with nothing, running for his life. And he came back to the same place with two companies. That means women 
children, herd, cattle. The Lord has so much blessed him. Great mercy had so much spoken for him that when he left with nothing, he came back with everything. For somebody here today, in the month of uncommon mercy, great mercy will speak for you. Where you have toiled and have caught nothing, in the month of uncommon mercy, where they have written you off and said, this is what you will amount to, great mercy will speak for you. In the name of Jesus. Look at Luke 1, 57 to 58. It says this, Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And when her neighbors and her relatives heard how the Lord had shown what? Great mercy to her. They rejoiced with her. Why? Because Elizabeth had been barren her whole life. And all of a sudden, when it seemed like the end of the story had come, and they knew that this is how it would end, she would always be barren, the Lord decides to say, actually, until I say it is not so, until I say it is done, it is not done, until I say it is finished, it is not finished, who says when God has not said? Who speaks when God has not spoken? I don't care what age you might be. You think you might be in the, in, the, in the twilights of your life and you have gone to a place to die. But God says, I'm not through with you yet. They are buried. They have rolled the stone. They have completed it. Nothing good can come out. Nothing good. We have seen everything he has to offer. They have seen everything she has to offer. This is how our story will end. Somebody shout great mercy. And Elizabeth, who had stood at nothing, her tummy empty, God decides to show great mercy. For somebody here, in this particular area, you have nothing to show for it. In this area, it has been defined as emptiness. You have been carrying a womb without a child. For somebody here, in whatever area, this has been a pain point in your life. But in the month of uncommon mercy, the Lord shall have great mercy. It was great mercy that you saw play out when Samuel went to David's house. And he came in because he said, go to the house of Jesse because I have found myself a king. And he got there. And Jesse brought the first. And someone said, surely this is the one. And God said, no. He said, okay. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. Number two, number three, number four, God said no. Number five, God said no. Number six, God said no. Number seven, God said no. And Saul, Samuel's perplexed. What do you mean, Lord? You've sent me here and I've seen everyone. And then he asked Jesse a question. Are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse says, oh, wait. <laughs> Even when your own father and mother forget you, the Lord can never forget his own. By Jesse's standard, David was not even in the equation. He was not even a candidate to even be, be, be even considered. It was impossible. Oh, there's one more. A young lad in the field, shepherding the goats and sheep. Clearly cannot be him. He's not king material. He does not have the qualifications. He does not have the requirements. He does not look the part. He doesn't talk the part. He does not have the pedigree. He didn't come from the right family. He does not have the right connection. She doesn't know the right people. She cannot speak English properly. She doesn't have the diction required or the look to enter these kinds of places. It cannot be. And then, 
Samuel says, go bring him, for we shall not sit. We shall not sit until he comes. And the man that was in obscurity, in the field forgotten, forgotten by man, men had given up on him. His family had forgotten he existed. But God said, great mercy, I have found one after my heart. Somebody who knows how to pull on my mercy strings. Somebody that always calls my name in the field and sings for me. I have found one who knows how to pull on my mercy. And they go and they bring David. And as soon as he comes in, the eighth one, the one that was disqualified, the one that was not even considered, the one that could not be the one. As soon as he walked in, Samuel says, this is the one. And he broke the oil and he anointed him king over Israel. Where they have, they have, they have blotted you out of the equation. Where they have removed your name. Where they have thrown your resume into the bin. Where they have said it cannot be you. In this month of uncommon mercy, Abre Ikataba Ishakataba, the Lord will show himself on your matter. Mercy will make the difference. Mercy will encompass you. Mercy will speak for you. In the name of Jesus. And from nowhere, from the back, to the front. Some of you have been worried. God, what will be of me? What will be of my life? What will happen to me? You know my story. You see what I've done. You see how far I've strayed. There's nothing good that can come out of But God says, my name is mercy. I will have mercy on whom I decide to have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I choose to have compassion. It is not about the one who wills. Or it's not about how you run. It is not given to the swift. It's not given to the strong. But the one who God decides to show mercy. Arise, O Zion. For the time To favor has come. The set time to show mercy has come. In this month of uncommon mercy, in the name of Jesus, everywhere you go, mercy will announce you. Where you need it, mercy will strengthen you. Where you need it, mercy shall be a hedge of protection around you. And when you need it the most, mercy will catapult you from the back to the front. Everything the caca and the palma and the locust worm has stolen, and you think you have lost it in time, in resources, you think that your life has been wasted, you think a decision has robbed you of your time, the race is not to the swifts. The Lord says, in this month of uncommon mercy, I shall accelerate you. You shall pursue. You shall overtake. You shall recover all. In the name of Jesus. Somebody shall mercy God. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. One more time, his name is mercy. Shall mercy God. The Lord's mercy will speak for you. In the name of Jesus.